united with Christ. Meet local churches with open doors serving throughout the Border Valley community and sharing the truth and hope of God's love and salvation. A presentation of Life Christian Broadcasting Television. And now, United with Christ. Happy Thanksgiving Eve. Welcome to United with Christ. My name is Mike Woods and I'm your host for today. And today we're going to do a Bible study based on the passage in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. So if you would like to follow along, I would encourage you to do this because we'll be looking at this passage in some detail today. Well, this is a busy time of the year, isn't it? It's a time when people are hustling and bustling, getting ready to be with their families for what I think probably is the greatest holiday of the year in the sense of really being grateful to God for who He is and what He's done for us. So today what we're going to do is look at this passage from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. Let's pray to begin with. Father, we do come to you with grateful hearts today. You are great and greatly to be praised. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name be glory because of your loving kindness and because of your truth. We understand, Lord, that we will not understand anything from the Bible unless your Holy Spirit is our teacher. So Holy Spirit, we ask you to teach us exactly what we need to know from this passage of Scripture in 2 Timothy. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, those who know tell us that this is the biggest week of travel in the United States of America every year. Last year, from Wednesday before Thanksgiving until Sunday after Thanksgiving, 51 million people traveled. The pundits say this year that should even go up. They're estimating 3% more people will take trips. And taking trips are fun, but actually they require things of those who are taking the trip correctly. And so let's take a look at this passage from 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning with verse 6 and reading through verse 8, regarding the most important of all trips. And all of us will make this trip. It's the final trip, the trip from this life into the next. We know what the Bible says in Acts 13, 36, where Luke writes that when David had fulfilled God's purpose for him in David's generation, he fell asleep. We also know that Solomon writes in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1, there is a time for every event under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die. This indeed is the ultimate trip. So let's take a look at Paul's own take about his ultimate trip from 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning with verse 6. Hence, he says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all have loved his appearing." The first thing that appears from this passage of Scripture and comes to mind is trips require preparation. And the final ultimate trip of our lives certainly requires preparation. Paul was prepared to meet the Lord when his life came to an end. And his preparation had been something he'd been devoting himself to from the word go in his walk with Christ. First of all, he says in this passage of Scripture in verse 7, he says, I have fought the good fight. Now this was not a fist fight that Paul fought. It was a faith fight because a little later in the passage of Scripture, he says, I have kept the faith. And what he was talking about 
is the body of truth that was known as the apostles' teaching. The truth that indicated that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. That he was buried and he was raised again on the third day according to the scripture. That God calls us out of darkness into his marvelous light to declare his excellencies to the world. Also included in those things which Paul had devoted himself to in this faith fight was the fact that we who know Jesus Christ have the incredible privilege that there is therefore now no condemnation for us who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because God made Jesus who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf in order that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. It is true that Paul had fought the good fight and won. He had fought the good fight against the world. The Bible says this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. He was a man of faith. He fought the good fight against the ruler of this world, none other than Satan himself. We tell, are told in the book of Ephesians by Paul that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. Paul tells us under inspiration of the Holy Spirit that we're to be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Paul didn't fight this fight of faith by himself. He fought it in the power of Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. And that's true for us too. We can't win this battle unless we walk by faith and not by sight. And we know that faith comes from hearing and hearing from the Word of God. And as we commune with the Lord, we listen to the Holy Spirit as He speaks to us. Then we are equipped to win the battle that we find ourselves in. And we can get ready to meet the Lord when He comes. Of course, we know we are saved by grace through faith and that not of ourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Paul understood this, and he has been used by the Lord for centuries to teach people like you and me that this fight is a fight of faith, trusting in Jesus Christ alone for our eternal life. This is how we get ready in this walk that we're in. He also won the fight over his own flesh as he describes it, which in essence simply means over himself. Our greatest enemy really is our own selfishness. And he tells us how we can overcome our own flesh. He says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. What that simply means is submit our lives to Jesus and make no provision for our selfishness, for our flesh. We have to be ready. Paul was ready because he had fought the good fight, he had kept the faith, and also he had finished the race. This echoes what the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 12, the first verse of the book of Hebrews, where that writer writes that we are to run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. Every day we who know Jesus have to trust in Him for the power to overcome this enemy of the world, the enemy of the devil himself, who is the ruler of the world, and also the enemy that's internal, our own selfishness. We have to be prepared. Paul was prepared. Are you prepared? More about that later. Another thing that comes to mind when we think about this statement which Paul makes in the sixth verse of 2 Timothy chapter 4 he says, the time of my departure has come. The word translated departure has many shades of meaning. It's one of those rich New Testament words which give us more insight into certain truths. This is as good an example of the richness of the New Testament language as any we could see. The second thing that's part of our making this trip, this ultimate trip 
that is necessary. First, we've talked about preparation, but also separation. When I think about taking a trip, whether it's at Thanksgiving or Christmas or some other time of the year, it speaks of separation from people. The Apostle Paul hated to leave the people whom he had loved and who had loved him in return. This letter was written to one of those people, Timothy. Timothy is described as his beloved son by Paul. He loved him. He was a great spiritual offspring of Paul. And when we leave this life, the difficulty of leaving is no more pronounced than we think about leaving our loved ones. I know it bothers you probably when you think of that. But this word translated departure gives us some insight about what's going to greet us when this world comes to an end for us. The word was used, for instance, to describe the solving of a math problem. Perhaps you're good at math. It was never my strong suit. But this life is full of puzzles for us, isn't it? Maybe you're puzzled over some relationship that has been difficult for you. A child who is an adult now, whom you raised in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and is no longer walking with the Lord. Perhaps you're thinking about the trouble you've had with your physical being. Your body is not creating those kinds of opportunities for you that you would like for it to create for you. We have problems. When we meet our Maker, when Jesus comes to receive us to Himself, then all those problems will be resolved. We will understand why things have not gone the way we thought they would at times. In the meantime, we keep walking by faith, trusting in the Lord, knowing that He is the God of all mercies who comforts us in our affliction. So He's near to us when we are troubled. Another way in which this word translated departure in the phrase, the time of my departure has come, is used. It was used to describe a team of oxen having the yoke removed from their necks, suggesting the day of work was over. This life is full of work, isn't it? Some of it's unpleasant. Not all of it is manual or physical. A lot of it's mental. There's a lot of anguish associated with work. But the good news is the Bible is clear. When we leave this world, go to be with the Lord in heaven, The Lord is not going to have us sweat at least when we work. Whatever we do is going to be incredibly pleasant because we'll be doing it in sync with the Lord. Yet another way in which the word departure is used, it's used to describe the solving of a mathematical problem, the end of a grueling day of labor for a team of oxen, but it's also used to describe the taking or breaking of chains off the hands and feet of either a slave or a prisoner of war. Isn't that a picture of what Christ has done for us? He himself said, The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus has done that for us. He came to set the captives free, and he has. But we're encumbered by these external forces of the world and the attacks of the devil, but also of our own internal struggles with our flesh, ourselves. We're going to be free of all that. And the chains will be finally and fully removed when the Lord comes to receive us. This final trip speaks of separation from people, but also from problems. Now, let's consider the third and final aspect of any trip that we take, and that is the destination. The destination for us, of course, is it will be with the Lord forever in heaven. Let's pause here just a moment and consider a very familiar teaching of Jesus in the book of John 14, verses 1 and following. Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. 
In my Father's house there are many dwelling places, and I go to prepare a place for you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Well, that's a mouthful, isn't it? But let's consider it together for a moment. Jesus was actually saying this to his apostles. Their hearts were troubled, and for good reason. Jesus was leaving them. They had given up everything to follow him, and now he was, in their minds, abandoning them. We can't be too critical of them, can we? We have a better perspective on what that meant for them than they did because of the rest of the New Testament and its teaching about what happens when Jesus leaves. The story is incomplete in their minds. But what we do know is he says, stop letting your heart be troubled. That's for you and me too. When we think about this world full of trouble, we're to trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not on our own understanding and all our ways acknowledge him and he will indeed make our path straight. We're to believe in him. Keep on believing in him. Believing in God as well. And he says, I am going to go and prepare a place for you in my father's house. Three times he uses that word place. The King James Version says, in my father's house there are many mansions. That's a poor translation of the word Actually, the word translated place or places in this passage is a word which was used to describe way stations, stopovers on a journey. What this suggests to us is that we're going to continue to grow when we go to be with the Lord in heaven. Heaven's not a place where we sit on a cloud playing a harp, twiddling our thumbs. Heaven's a place that's dynamic and we're going to continue to grow in our relationship to the Lord in our understanding of Him and of things that we haven't even considered. And if He goes and prepares a place for us, He will come again and receive us to Himself. Another factor in this great teaching of Jesus is that He talks about preparing a place for you over and over, for you, for you. He has prepared a place for you, customized for you. I don't think I need to remind you Jesus' profession until he was 30 years of age was that of a carpenter. He's prepared a luxury suite for you in heaven because you have trusted in him. If you've not trusted in him, well, now's the day of your salvation. You need to trust in him. And he says he's going to come and receive us to himself that where he is, there we may be also The real attraction in heaven is not to be associated with streets of gold or gates of pearl. Those things will be awesome. But the big attraction is the person of Jesus having unhindered fellowship with Him, but not only Him, with others who make up the body of Christ, loved ones who have preceded us, parents, maybe in some cases children, maybe even a grandchild, someone whom you love so dearly and they left too soon as far as you were concerned. Well, the good news is they'll be waiting for you when you arrive. They'll be part of that place that the Lord has customized for you in heaven. It's beautiful to think about, isn't it? Well, going back to this simple phrase that we've emphasized a lot together today, the time of my departure has come. The word departure is another way of saying that we have been given another assignment. The reason I say that is because the word departure was not only used to describe the solving of a math problem, the loosing of slaves, the removing of a yoke from a team of oxen after a hard day's work, but it was also used to describe the striking of tents by a whole army. Their commander said, strike the tent. We're going to another place of duty. That's what happens when we leave this world. The Bible says we will serve our Lord day and night. During World War II, the Royal Air Force of Great Britain kept that 
island free and really served as a buffer against the Third Reich taking over the world. When they had been on a mission, they would come back, the pilots would clean up, go and look at the names of those among their comrades who had been lost in the battle. By the names of those who had died in the battles was not the word dead, but the word posted to another place of duty. That's what happens when we leave this world. The time of our departure is coming. We're going to go serve the Lord. And here's another and final way in which this word departure is used outside the New Testament. It's used to describe the weighing of an anchor of a ship, the taking up of the anchor before it sets sail. Isn't that a beautiful figure of speech? It's true. The journey will continue throughout eternity for us. The time of our departure is sooner than we think. Perhaps you saw or read the movie and or the book of the Lord of the Rings. And if you did, you remember the last scene of the return of the king in both book and cinema. And you'll know that the hero, Frodo, a member of the Fellowship of the Rings, is getting ready to set sail. His four closest friends, Pippin, Mary, and of course Samwise Gamgee, his closest friend, are saddened at the thought of this dear friend Frodo leaving. And he gives them a warm embrace before he leaves. He's excited. They're not so excited because they're losing a close friend. But he gets in the boat and as the scene closes, he sails to the west. And as he sails toward the west, he becomes more and more energized at the knowledge that he's going to be in his final resting place. When we go to be with the Lord, it's going to be something beyond our imagination. It's going to be wonderful. The time of our departure has come. I failed to mention at the outset, this word time is one of two terms used in the New Testament. The word time is not what we would consider sequential time, moment after moment, hour after hour. Rather, it's a special time infused with eternal impact in our lives. It's an opportunity that God has given us. The time is coming. It's going to be the greatest opportunity after receiving Christ that we will have experienced in this life. So as we conclude our time together today, we think about what Jesus said again in John chapter 14. He said, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And then Thomas, one of the apostles, we call him Doubting Thomas, said, Lord, how do we know where you are going? How can we know where you are going? And Jesus said those beautiful words to Thomas. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the way. We come to him in this life. It's not without notice that Jesus is described as the way in this passage of Scripture, but also the Christian life is called the way by Luke in the book of Acts. It's a way of life because we walk it in connection with Jesus and He infuses us with His life. Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, He who hears my word and believes Him who sent me has eternal life. When you trust in Jesus, you have eternal life. Today is the time of salvation, perhaps for you. You have yet to give your life fully to the Lord Jesus Christ. And He's saying to you, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you, and you shall find rest for your souls. That simply means 
submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Trust in Him alone and you will be a person who has eternal life right now. You don't have to wait until you draw your last breath right now. And in the interim between now and then, you can live in fullness of joy and peace because of who Jesus is and who He has become to you as you trust in Christ alone. The Bible says in the book of Acts, there is no other name under heaven whereby people can be saved except the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Donald Barnhouse, who was a great pastor, Presbyterian in the 20th century, lost his wife. She and he both in their mid-30s. He had three small children. As they left the cemetery, they were all sitting in the back, that is the children, and he was wondering what could he say to these dear children who had become orphaned when their mother died to encourage them? He was rarely at a loss for words when it came to moments like this, but he was at a loss. He was driving on a two-lane highway, and all of a sudden the Lord gave him inspiration. He was passed from the opposite direction by a semi-truck, and as the truck passed by, he had a flash of inspiration. He leaned back over the front seat and said, Children, would you rather be run over by the truck that just passed us or by its shadow? His children thought their father had lost his mind. They said, Father, by the shadow, of course. And then Dr. Barnhouse said to his children, Children, Jesus Christ was run over by death 2,000 years ago so that we might only be run over by its shadow. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. My friend, Jesus is with us. He'll be with us no more fully than when the moment comes for us to leave this world. We just have to fully give Him control of our lives and watch Him work. Would you join me in prayer? Dear Father, we thank You for this great truth that You have offered us eternal life and it's ours for trusting in You and You alone, Lord. So we ask now as we pray that You would respond as You always will to our invitation to You to give us eternal life as we trust you wholeheartedly with our lives. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.